Hello, Simon. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Georgie. How's it going? Uh, happy to see you again. We met. It's uh, very funny because this is the first time uh, I'm seeing... No, it's the second time probably where I meet the guests f for the second time on the podcast and I've met them beforehand on, on live to, <laughs> yeah, it's to not get to usual, know them. It seems... Yeah, it was very unusual place where I met you in Sofia. Yeah, yeah, sure. And it was like so, like, uh, really, what's the word, like, unplanned, because I just saw, like, that you were visiting Sofia, uh, like, in one of your Instagram story. And I was like, oh, actually, since I happen to be there for the whole week as well, I should, uh, should definitely say hi. So it was very fun that we managed to catch up because it's been a while that we kind of wanted to. So that was very, very funny. And uh, yeah. Uh, unplanned. I don't have the the other word. My English I, sucks too. I'm, <laughs> I'm always surprised when like there are people like you're from France originally, and um, and they come to visit Bulgaria. And I always I'm always very curious to know um, what are the impression. Maybe we can discuss that uh, later. But for the people who <laughs> don't know you, you can introduce yourself and say what you do. And uh, by the way, you're one of my um you don't know it but you're one of my tutors and teachers <laughs> <laughs> i learned a lot from you without you knowing it that's fun that's uh i'm glad to hear that uh stuff that i do are useful for some people uh so well i'm usually very bad at introducing myself but um i so i do like mainly architectural visualization i started my studio uh with numbers like six or seven years ago uh right after i graduated from uh my university in france in strasbourg and for some reason i went straight into visualization and almost went straight into starting my own studio i never i didn't work one year uh we can talk about that very, like a little bit of after but uh almost straight into working for my own client and working for fun for my own stuff because I always like the, for instance, the tutorial that you're referring to are things I started right away. Even if I was like just discovering the field, I already wanted to share what I was doing and trying to sort of, uh, I don't know, experiment with uh, like tutorials and trying to, to, yeah, just be a little bit transparent about what I was doing, even though like, not that it mattered, but it was a good way for me to sort of uh, keep track of like the progress I was making and what were the stuff I was learning as I was learning them. So it was kind of a keeping a record of uh, what I was doing. And so, yeah, I, I do mostly like images, but I like, I'm spending more and more time on like teaching and trying to put together a course and working more on like, uh, yeah, like, I don't like the word teaching for some reason, but whatever. Uh, it's just yeah, mentoring. Sure. You can yeah, use mentoring. Maybe, maybe that would be that. I think it's just because teaching has this very uh, like institution sounding thing, and maybe mentoring doesn't. I don't. I honestly don't know. But yeah, I think it's also because I. I think it's pretty also the spirit is like even though I like this idea of like people learning things is just really me just talking about stuff I like. I'm not like actively trying to convey ideas, which is why sometimes my videos are super messy. It's because I'm just like literally talking about a topic like blah, blah, blah. But I'm not really like uh, trying to be like, you should think this and here are like some ideas that you should uh, think about or whatever. So yeah, it's kind of been my way of sharing what I'm doing so far. I'm trying to get more structure lately. <laughs> no, I think I remember when I first so I discovered your website through Federico Bianculo's blog, the Ctrl Z blog, and mm -hmm. there was a list of websites where you could learn a lot about I don't know visualization, Photoshop, post production, and so on. And mm -hmm. I went to your website, and I liked that it's so practical that I could read step by step. I, mm -hmm. I, I think back in the days you were doing these uh, videos where they were also without any audio, you just could see your workflow and it was also kind of speed up or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so sure. I needed to like pause and be like, what the fuck did he click? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Those were definitely not aimed at being like tutorials, but I know that many people complain about like, can you do it like slower so that we can? So I actually did like something like this very not very recently but like last year 
like a more walkthrough of like the, the like basic workflow I go through so that people could have like a better look at it without being too stressed at looking at super fast moving images. Uh, fortunately, I graduated, so I didn't need to do overnighters and <laughs> watch tutorials <laughs> about how to make my projects look good. Uh, but how about you? Why did you decide you wanted to become an architect? A lot of people maybe have already like someone in the family or, I don't know, play with Lego. It's a very <laughs> cliche one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, my story is kind of cliche in a way as in like my mother was a is an architect or was she kind of retired but um and it kind of had i think sort of an influence on me the thing is i was mostly um fascinated with like more like, like video games and comic books and stuff like that so more like the graphic idea and there's like always this time i think it's the same in every country where you have to choose like where what do you want to study after high school and for some reason i didn't have like a I know that so I had like friends in architecture that literally said like when I was eight years old, I knew I wanted to become an architect. I was like definitely not that type of person. I was more like, what is the type of studies that from what I understood from it sort of opens the most doors in stuff that are like kind of creative in a way. And the funny thing is that back then I didn't even know about uh, architectural visualization. I was like still getting into that field thinking I'm going to be an architect or whatever. And, um, and yeah, so it's like why I kind of ended up in there because also it's just like my other options were literally like engineering and I actually didn't even like science or like that type of science, and especially in like academia because I don't find it very like uh, motivating or um, sort of like, yeah. Uh, uh, I don't have the word, we'll come back later, whatever. But yeah, not very, yeah, shit. It's not your environment, yeah. let's say. Yeah, no, definitely not. It's like, um, and even in architecture, which architecture is kind of a fun thing because it's, uh, it's a completely different environment than the rest of like university. And at the same time, it was still not fitting me really well because it was still like very, like there's a lot of rules, there's a lot of, ways you have to do things and there's a lot of also like inefficiencies on like how stuff are very weirdly communicated so after five years of architecture you're still like not even sure of like how anything works and this is something i found very i'm, I'm still happy about like the whole study thing i was especially grateful regarding the i did one of my my first year of masters i did it in australia i was studying in sydney and they had like a very different mindset and a very different approach to literally everything. And this is where I discovered like a more organized way of like um, tackling like architectural design and also like the whole aspect of um, basically architectural theory, which is something I'm still like super interested in. And I've always been interested in like theory in general about like thinking and like trying to understand a bit deeper how like any item or topic works because I don't know. It's just, I think it's just the, the way I am. I like to understand probably how things work. And the thing is that maybe in architecture, it wasn't the best. Uh, it's basically an introduction. Like you, you tend to think when you start a, uh, your studies that after five years, you'll understand everything or at least have a very good understanding of the topic. And after five years or more, like, yeah, this was an introduction to everything related to architecture. And now you still have to basically do everything. So this was uh, an interesting realization that took a long time. Where, for how long did you go to <clears throat> Australia? And and actually, you, were, you're original from southern France, if I'm not wrong. Where did you study, like, your main... I'm, I'm from uh, eastern France, near Switzerland. Oh, yeah, sorry. It's, it's okay. <laughs> I don't have the, the Southern French accent, so I'm, I'm grateful for that as well. But um, uh, well, actually, maybe my accent is worse when I speak French, whatever. <laughs> uh, and so I studied I, in, in Strasbourg, so a little bit like it's an hour north from my hometown. And uh, so, yeah, I studied there for like, I did graduate from there, but yeah. I did like one year in Australia. And was it... Did you have any like cultural shocks apart of the, of course, like the different school, but 
I mean, when I moved from Italy to Germany, although it's so close, the cultures mm -hmm. are so much different and I had to experience a lot of like culture shock in the beginning because I didn't <laughs> understand the, the local culture. So how was it in Australia for a person coming from France? Mm, well, how can I say? In a way, I always kind of feel felt like I was not really super tailored for friends. So there's like a lot of things I hate about that country, like my country, and uh, <laughs> which explained why I was always move, trying to move around and like go travel because I was never really like I love the the people and the like the country and whatever. But there's like stuff in the mentality that didn't really fit how I was thinking. And so going to Australia was actually very not good for me, but like it felt nice because this, like people seemed like more open-minded and more, um, yeah, just more friendly for some reason. And I remember like one of the, the not striking thing, but like when I went there, I was already starting to work on my thesis or not the thesis, but it's like the, and uh, the on the last two years you have to, yeah, exactly. And it was something related to heritage management and like restoration and stuff like that. And they had a completely different way of handling their heritage that I found like way more interesting than what we do in France. And so I did my whole thesis about that. Let's call it a thesis. That's, that's interesting. Did... What, are, what are the difference? Because I studied in Rome and in Rome, it's like a very, very big deal, you know, like. Mm -hmm. um... It's, they're just, I think they're kind of changing, but um, at least back then when I was over there. In France, we're very conservative, so any everything is like heritage. We don't touch anything. It's very complicated to make anything, or not original necessarily, but like um, like that doesn't really fit the the law and the regulations. And over there, even though they have like pretty strong regulations, they still had like a way more daring approach of like how they would handle uh, heritage stuff. So. The, always the image that I have that is fun is that there's like, um, I don't remember the area, I think it's Paddington or whatever, but they have like little terrace houses that are like super cute. And there's like a huge tower on top of like one of them. And the thing is like, the, the th how can I say, whether you like it or not, for me, like was not even the, the problem. It's just like the fact that it's possible was very interesting to me to think that you can actually build something like this. Because this is something that you, maybe you could, I don't, I don't really think you will never see that in France ever because we just don't, don't even think this is like a, yeah, if we, in, if most people think it's not a good idea, we'll not do it. So the, the big, the big topic regarding this was, um, um, Notre Dame, no, because when it, it burned, there were yeah. this rendering coming out of this new church with the, the glass rooftop. Yeah, yeah. And I was thinking that's so cool. Why they don't do it? It would be like, actually, I think it's because in uh, Rome, we, we have a lot of, you know, philosophy about how you do restoration. Mm -hmm. And um, sure. they say if something is old, you have to keep it old. And if something is new added to this old, that sort of re re-emerges what it was the new mm -hmm. part should be clearly done in a new way so it should be mm -hmm. completely on a material that's very clean you shouldn't for example americans yeah, you can differentiate yeah americans try to do always this like um um fake old let's call mm -hmm. it yeah um, yeah like pastiche thing that looks super weird germans reconstruct a lot the same as it was and mm -hmm. um i think um for for the history that this cathedral has and i mean all of us got to learn even if we're not from france i think it was because it was um, so many natural evolutions through history it mm -hmm. would have been cool if our like ages would have had i don't know a glass rooftop or something yeah yeah it's it was literally the like the last two years you work on your thesis and ideally you manage to tie your graduation project to it. And I had like the, my graduation project was very tied to uh, heritage management. And I was basically, because I was always an annoying student, I insisted on doing a, con a contract a project on the cathedral of uh, Strasbourg. And instead of saying like, I'm just going to build, because that's the thing is like, as I said, I'm like interested in theory. So I had like a whole 
project and narrative around mm -hmm. what it means, like what's what does a cathedral mean in the twenty well in the twenty first century, and what is it to like use this type of uh, of buildings, and what was the history of those buildings back in the days where they were actually like used as schools, as hospitals, as like many different things. And the funny thing is that in the the one in Strasbourg, at least, used to have like almost like this sort of parasitic relationship with the city because the buildings were directly built on top of the cathedral, like until very late in medieval uh, age. And then they sort of like, when you started having like more uh, like urban um, design, they started to remove all those buildings in order to have like, like a plaza and have something that looks a bit cleaner, if I may say. And so the whole idea of the project was to sort of like get back to this idea of like uh, appropriating the 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 cathedral as a as a like public object kind of. So it was like all very uh, utopian, or dystopian, whatever you think about it. But it was uh, it was an interesting thing, and I was kind of the funny thing is that I was uh, I was sort of like intentionally very like uh, like trolling almost. Like I had like very when I did my presentation. Half of the jury was like, this is amazing. Half of it was like, you should you should leave this room right now. <laughs> so it was like, okay. But it was, uh, I wouldn't say it was a good uh, good memory because it definitely wasn't. But uh, it was a very interesting thing to say the least. And yeah, so what, coming back to what you were saying about Notre Dame is like, it would have been, not only would it have been uh, like fun, but it would have been like, logical in the logic of like how normally cathedral tend to work as is like as you were saying it's like we should add like different layers whether it's like a glass roof or whatever but it should be more um, more uh, like contemporary in terms of uh, the design so yeah, yeah I, I had an opposite reaction to my thesis because they told me like um, I, I tried to do the opposite I tried to do something very realistic very feasible because i mm -hmm. had already worked in an office here in germany and i wanted to show that i knew how to make um, a building actually mm -hmm. buildable by following all the regulations by creating a um, sort of a setup that actually considers what will be the technical requirements for mm -hmm. such a building and such it was a big project and they told me yeah you're too too this is too realistic you should okay. be more That's academical cool. and and my idea behind it, it was because my boss told me that when i apply for for new jobs uh, they want always to see like your professional skills and i told okay i yeah, just need my i just need my thesis to get jobs i don't need it to show the professors how yeah, crazy yeah. i am but i mean it's all respectable and i was thinking one thing because i actually um, it's counterintuitive, but I lived in Rome and we did a lot of restoration and it's probably the hardest subject you have in that university and therefore I hated it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but one thing that is very characteristic of um, restoration is that you have to go on site and actually do a lot of measurements and build a very exact reproduction of the object and um, sometimes you need to exactly take pictures and redraw brick by brick how it mm -hmm. is the actual situation you have all this um yeah machinery let's call it to make these clouds of of uh points to reconnect yeah. to rebuild a model is it also this some um, connection that then naturally pushed you towards uh, 3D modeling, 3D representation, because it's it's almost on a scientific level, right? It's like yeah, just... I I see what you mean. Uh, I don't think it is. I think the funny thing with architecture in general is that I started liking it when I stopped it. Like I started understanding literally, like even my um, my uh, how's it called, like uh, course about like um, structure and like how to calculate stuff couldn't get anything done while I was working there or working or studying there. And as soon as I left uh, university and checked again my course, I was like, oh, okay, this is what they meant. And I don't know why, but there was like a complete mindset shift of like a lot of stuff started making sense. So I, I always wonder if it's like just a question of time or if it's like the tutor uh, not explaining stuff properly or whatever. And regarding what you were saying is like, I think the, the, 
I was always like when it, one thing actually that can also I think that sort of like um, helped me in starting getting there is like when I was in Australia, they have a very intense uh, computing or computer uh, like uh, post processing and like rendering uh, pretty advanced curriculum. And basically, when I went there, I learned most of uh, most of what I knew and used in uh, during my studies. I learned it from there. And also because I was working with people that had like a very good understanding and were actually very good tutors. They're now, nowadays, they are tutors because they were very good at explaining uh, how things work and have like a proper methodology and stuff like that. So I started being very interested in like the visual aspects and the three aspect back then, I think. So when I, and the funny, well, not funny, but when I got back, since it's something that is not really um, like, not in France because all the schools are very different, but at least in the school I was in, it was not their cup of tea. So they were like, yeah, well, the re your renderings are good, but we, we don't care. And I was like, yeah, well, I don't care either, but still. And... No, yeah. There are some professors that hate renderings in general. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe because they're not able to do any, I don't know. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's like, a, it's always something that I find um I completely understand the the idea because you get more easily deceived by a 3D model and a good rendering than by a drawing. So for me, it's okay because I literally was doing that. Is that uh, I had projects that were like working, but I was doing like very nice, well, not like uh, relatively to what I was, what other people were doing back then. Pretty nice images, so they looked better than what they actually were. So we, I had a friend um, when I was in Rome that was an Erasmus student from Spain, and Spanish Spanish students are really good at representation. And he told me a lot of stuff about Photoshop. It was the first time I I learned mm -hmm. how to actually draw something in a nice way. It was probably my second semester or second year. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> he was a really funny guy, and he told me, "Look." The most important thing is that you draw the project in a good way. You know what? Because a good looking project, it's like, uh, no, a bad project that it's the drawn in a good way and it looks good. It's like a good looking girl with a bad character. You know, she's a bitch, <laughs> but <laughs> you still want to have her. <laughs> So I, re I remember this analogy forever. So he was like, you know, all that girls that have the super nice character, but they're not so good looking and you don't want them. I mean, if a girl is listening, vice versa, I don't know, a guy, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's so true. It's so true that, um, I mean, if you have both, it's the sweet point. But if you have yeah, no, but it's, one. it's true that like we get deceived very easily by like the looks of something and there's like a whole debate about it at least that's the funny thing is that there's a debate about it amongst architecture uh, architects and it, this debate doesn't exist at all amongst uh archivist people because they kind of like have too much at stake in a way because it's literally their job so they're like yeah no no we should do uh renderings it's very important <laughs> and you're like nah not necessarily no, but um, it's it. I I think also renderings look way better than like even reality, because um, renderings have this kind of perfection that the buildings never gonna have. Uh, they have also they omit certain parts because mm -hmm. the moments they like. I don't know when you do every project, you do the renderings and you don't have all the stuff that usually gonna have. For example. On the facade, you won't have all the, I don't know, water pipes that are coming out. You won't yeah, have all like this, um, I don't know. Conditioning units and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, you're not going to have maybe a scratch, maybe the dirt, maybe uh, it's it's a built reality that looks, in my opinion, always way better than... I mean, there are so many projects that get so close to their renderings, but they're, I mean... Also, the rendering has these colors that you never see <laughs> or you see mm -hmm. very rarely. So they're, uh, are you going to fake even the sunlight? So I don't know, the project looked nice, but in reality, that's a north facade. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's that's always a very, uh, 
it's a complicated balance even for the the person doing the image because it actually depends even on the the person mm -hmm. itself like because some people will be will go completely overboard with mm -hmm. like restylizing the whole build not the building but like the the scene etc to make it like very i don't even want to say good but like just like over the top in your face sometimes the client that is going to push the artist to say like can you remove this can you do that blah 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 and it's always like a fine line to find so that you it's kind of like almost kind of a ethical question in the sense like how much do you want to deceive like the the end viewer because in the end it's like for me i know i'm very uh basically i like like the type of images i like are actually very natural so i don't i will never go or at least always try to avoid to go overboard with like super weird lighting or stuff like that or like to have like millions of people in a space where there's supposed to be three and it's always like uh it's uh how can i say unbalanced maybe <laughs> Yeah, and it's it's always like the um, like one thing basically is like as you said like they look better, and I think it's always like this. Just the how can I say? Sometimes the main problem is you listen to your client; they describe you what they want. You as like a professional, you can picture how this is gonna look, and when you do it, and it looks the way it should look in a way they actually don't really the client don't necessarily respond properly to what you're proposing because it's not enough because there's really this uh i don't know if it's like a tendency but like as you said like stuff have to look perfect and it's like it's funny because in renderings we like the i don't say i'm not going to say it's a trend it's more like when you reach a certain level you start to incorporate uh imperfections again because this is what makes things look realistic and so when you start having like leaks on concrete, some clients will go crazy and be like, no, 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 we don't want fucking leaks on the concrete. It has to be like perfectly clean. You're like, yeah, but it doesn't look realistic. So you have to find this balance on like some materials that have to have like a look that doesn't look too fake because then it actually doesn't look good because it's just so perfect that it doesn't look realistic. And when something actually doesn't look realistic for the eye of the viewer, sometimes it actually catches your attention too much, but in a bad way. So. No, yeah, totally. But I think that nowadays um, it's uh, the um, it's the the rendering world. It's getting like very over, in my opinion. And, and, and I don't know. I'm not in. I I'm an observer. I'm a client <laughs> usually. <laughs> but uh, there are so many offices that you look very very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, like you cannot say I don't know if one image was done by one or the other. They could be both. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's also depending on which country you're working for. So mm -hmm. if you do a rendering, for instance, for Bulgaria, or you do it um, for Denmark, it will be very different what they're going to want, or for Germany. Because yeah. in Bulgaria, we, not we, I, I don't like it, but people there like it, um, that it's um, very oversaturated with a lot yeah, of yeah. like this extra perfect people extra pretty woman <laughs> that women yeah, or something like that commercial looking that artistic looking in a way yeah i can say like and they're very fitting with uh, there is something oriental like the mm -hmm. similar but yeah. weird the weird thing is that that style fits to U the uk too like mm -hmm. if you see for example there are some projects like uh back in the days they released the uh, Tulip, that project from Norman yeah, yeah. Foster, yeah, yeah, yeah. that was like, um, it seemed like the How I Met Your Mother building where the, the yeah, I don't yeah. know if you have watched that show where his yeah, boss yeah, made yeah. a <laughs> penis-like building and nobody yeah. wanted to tell him. Uh, well, nobody <laughs> told Norman Foster either about that one. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that yeah. was done by D-Box, I think, but they have this style that's very saturated and yeah, that fits sure. to Dubai. But I like the clean one that it's more like the Spanish style, the Danish style, the in Italy. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, there are a lot of uh, good offices. Um, so I think now you have these two more or less 
views and uh, to to as you said theories and to styles. Uh, but you mentioned mm -hmm. before that you like never wor worked for somebody. You directly after school started this thing. So how this that work? How did that happen? Um, I I uh, know just a couple of people that managed to do this. <laughs> yeah, I was probably quite lucky, but. I, after I graduated, so in France, for some reason, or at least in my school, we graduated in September instead of June, like all the others. And from September to about March or April, uh, I was with a bunch of friends and we were just making competitions all the time of like uh, ID competitions. And it was very fun. I already, I didn't like start Oroma like, legally speaking i was just like learning new softwares and starting the blog etc and literally i don't remember what month it was but whatever uh, uh when i got all the paperwork done to be able to start working uh, a friend of mine was uh, telling me that one company like a architecture firm in paris was looking for a, a visualization guy uh, in-house And for some reason, I just wanted to check it because it's a, a firm I like. They're called uh, TVK. TVK. Uh, they do like urban stuff and like they do many projects. Actually, they're pretty like a very good firm and they have like a lot of uh, cool stuff in Paris and around. And so I went for the interview with my friend because he was applying for another position in the same firm. And I ended up working there for a year. And um, so... At first, I was hoping that it would be uh, that I would be part of a team of like people doing visualization, but actually, the guy that was there was just leaving, and I was replacing him. So he sort of like uh, explained me everything in like uh, maybe an hour, and then he left. <laughs> I was like, okay, cool. So back then, the I guy didn't... that was working before there just told you in an hour what he was doing, and he left. Yeah, he, he literally had to leave the country and he was like going back to whatever. And so I almost <laughs> didn't have time to ask him any questions. So it was very fun. But in the end, it worked out pretty well. But yeah, so when I arrived there, I I had like a, a very basic understanding of 3ds Max. I was pretty good at Photoshop and I was using SketchUp all the time. They were using SketchUp, so that was fine. And I knew none of the plugins that everybody was using like already for us back was like did exist back then but i had no idea of what the hell it was i don't know still is. what it is you can you explain it briefly <laughs> it's just a, a scattering program to like a, ah, okay. a plugin that like you scatter many vegetation stuff but you can use it for other stuff like uh, and that's for 3ds max um yeah i think it's only for 3ds max maybe it's for other stuff or that. what is it called again uh forest pack Ah, from for like respect. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, I know that one. Like great flown, et cetera. Um, mm. Very good plugins. And so, yeah, I had to find my way around this. The job itself was very interesting. I mean, it's super intense because you're on like architecture uh, schedules. So I was like in the lucky ones because I was starting very late in the morning, but I would be finishing very late at night. And it was, uh, but it was fun. The projects I was working on were quite interesting. So I was, uh, they do a lot of competitions. So this is like where I learned how to be efficient and be, how to have like a proper workflow to be able to deliver uh, many images in like a short amount of time. And the other aspect that was interesting and that I was interested in when I did the interviews, like I was telling them I'm interested in theory and like, um, uh, like brand identity and blah, blah, blah. And so there was like a department for like more like marketing and uh, branding, et cetera. So I was working with them as well in order to develop like a sort of identity for the, the actual renderings and how they could look so that they become a bit more recognizable. But um, I stayed there for a year and I started my, I was getting clients on the side for, uh, for my own firm. And um uh, And the first six months, I was getting like very few contracts because it was um, like I was not, I never did any marketing in like seven years. I don't do any marketing. Everything is like organic growth. So it's just like referrals, et cetera. So the first clients I got, they were actually um, friends from university that started working in their 
like uh, firms and they were like, oh, I know this guy that can do images. And so I worked with them. Uh, and I had like maybe a couple of, um, couple of contracts there. And after three or four months when I was in Paris, I moved to another flat because I had like really amazing experience in the first one. So I'm happy to move out. And, uh, and the guy that was my new flatmate was actually, uh, an architect as well. And he was working in, a in, a in, a in a firm in Paris and they became one of my first big clients that gave me like many, many stuff to do for at least a couple of years. And after that managed after a year, for some reason, I was, uh, feeling like I could, uh, could work uh, full-time on my own thing, even though it wasn't necessarily, it was like very, like, as you were saying, like, I don't know many people that started right after, I think it was just literally because I, I didn't pay attention to if it made sense or not. I was just like, yeah, I'm going to do it. And in the same way, like when I, one year later, I was like, yeah, I'm going to go full-time on this, even though I had like just a few clients and there was no, uh, like certainty that they would come back or that there would be others later, but, um, something you start to be comfortable with like a sort of uncertainty over time when you're working alone yeah no that's definitely um cool opportunity so you started to get clients through all your network so to say and uh, um did you could you take the portfolio you had built up at this office or did you need to start um all over again because a lot of the times when you work for an office they're also the owner of all everything you do so no um... they were they were like super nice guys and they were like super supportive when i left they actually like uh i kept them as clients as well for at least another two years i think mainly because they they struggled to find someone to replace me for some reason even though mm -hmm. their position is actually quite nice and uh so i kept working for them for quite a long time and they were like letting me do uh, additional images of the projects we worked on and uh letting me as long as I was crediting them they didn't care anyway so you yeah, know it's i definitely had like a nice portfolio when i left and also i still had like even though this is like extremely time consuming but uh, i was working i was doing a lot of uh side projects for fun like uh, personal projects so like remodeling buildings i like or designing my own projects and then doing a few renderings for this so then you start having like quite a bit of uh, material to show so yeah, no, that was, uh, that was fun. And, um, so that was in Paris or was it in another city then when you started all, all on your own? Um, to be honest, I, I'm not even sure I remember it correctly. I think I was in Strasbourg. I went to Paris for a year and then I think I went back to Strasbourg for a little bit. And then I went back to my parents for also a little bit again. And then I moved back to Paris again. And I think, I'm not even sure what happened after. I've been moving around quite a bit. At some point we ended up in, uh, in Barcelona in, uh, three years ago. So yeah, <laughs> I've always been like, I was basically following my girlfriend at the time, like what she was, uh, doing. Cause she, she, she's an architect as well. And she was like moving around and, uh, doing like, trying to like going to different jobs. And since I had this, um, one of the thing I, actually that also drew me to, um, working on my own was that it's this idea of like a little bit more freedom of like, I can move around, um, uh, and not have to work from the office all the time. That was something that was actually quite important to me. And so it led me to yeah travel a little. But so all the start was done mainly from France. Not entirely and, from France. And one thing is that you work basically solo. So you are like, a, you, you're a company of one, let's say that. Yeah. And, and um, how is, um, do you have something to, because you said you didn't, or at least when you do the, the part where you share your knowledge, you're not so structured. Um, do you have, did you find a way or a balance to, to find a structure to, for, for yourself? Because I think 
when you are employed and you go to work, you are already within a structure. Uh, you are within a preset office, you have your colleagues. So basically, if you don't show up, at least your colleagues going to be mad at you. So uh, <laughs> there is that part too. Um, how it is to work solo? How do you how do you do you have a routine because also a lot of people like work from home uh mm -hmm. even before that was a thing so yeah how do you structure your day or your workflow it's a very not complicated question but the the answer is going to be again very messy um i think the the issue i had back when i started was that um i was reading a lot about Mm, I was reading a lot about work and like the stuff I was doing, but I was also reading a lot about like most of like those not self development book, but more like a uh, uh, business development book. So very productivity oriented and like uh, grinding and blah, blah, blah. And so I was basically working all the time, uh, way too much because that's the thing, as you were saying, is like when you, alone when you're working at your own place it's very hard to to segment and say i'm going to stop working when i was when i was still working and uh, at tvk was like the schedule that i was having were like literally horrible because i would start at like as i was saying i was lucky because i would start at like nine or ten but then i would finish around six or seven if i was lucky or maybe i could finish until like three or four in the morning but even if I was finishing at those hours, then I would work for my client when I was getting back. So either way, I was always working until two or three in the morning the whole week. And so this is definitely not like sustainable. <laughs> so I did that for like a year when I was there. I kept doing this when I was working alone because I was like way too anxious about how things were. Like there's two things, like there's the positive aspect. Like I want to do a good work for my client because like for many reasons, like I just like doing the best I can. And at the same time, there's like this bad aspect of like, nobody's going to stop me from working uh, 15, 16, 18 hours a day, because that's, uh, I'm like uh, very convincing when I say, don't talk to me, I need to work. And so it's um, for a very long time, it was definitely not, not sustainable and not healthy. And um, I think the only, that's the, the good thing with it is that, uh, with it, with uh, what I have in mind, which is, as I was saying earlier, I'd never do any marketing. So it means that my, uh, how's it called, like stream of uh, clients is actually very, it's not like every week I have something to do. There will be sometimes, like I was talking about that in the newsletter, like uh, last year, last year, the first three or four months of the year, I had zero contract. And it's a funny position to be in because literally you can do anything. It's like, since I, it's almost like uh, on purpose, I don't look for clients. I just like do my best with the clients I have. Aren't and you, aren't you scared that, or you didn't have new clients or you didn't have like work at all? Oh no, I didn't have work at all. It's just, it's, it used to be very scary because you yeah you don't know you don't know what the fuck is going on and you're like well how is it gonna evolve and the best way to sort of work with that is actually to uh to have money on the side properly organized and because i was reading a lot of like uh, personal finance stuff etc and this happened so it was it was it wasn't like maybe it wasn't last year no it was last year but it was okay but during covid for instance a lot of people were like uh having issues because they were like not having any contracts etc and the reason usually people get annoyed or anxious if they don't have a contract is because then they mean it means they don't make any money but when you start having like if you saved for a long time and you have like enough money in your bank account then it actually it's not that it doesn't matter but it's just like the anxiety is just like much much lower you're like i could literally have no client for the next year and still pay my salary and pay my rent, etc. So that's a comfortable position to be in, but it took me six years to get there. And so once you're there, it's actually, there's a lot of benefit from it because then you 
get less anxious about not getting clients. You get less uh, needy in the sense that it doesn't mean that if a client comes, it doesn't mean that I have to accept uh, the contract because there's no like uh, economical incentive to a certain extent, of course. But um, how do you deal with the fact that you like, have you learned by now or was it hard in the beginning to not have this um, security, let's call it? Uh, uh, yeah, no, no, as I said, it, it was horrible. <laughs> like working alone is very, it's very complicated. And the thing is like, it's very stressful and stress is like the worst thing because it's something you can communicate very easily to others. So like you make the life of your girlfriend miserable if you're like stressed all the time and then you're like, yay, it's just, it's very bad. So there's like, the money aspect is like a very basic one, but it's like not the easiest. And then as you were saying, it's like there's routine and things like this. So um, I was, one of the things I think that helped a lot actually, is also the fact that I was working on the, like on the YouTube channel or like the tutorials or stuff like that, because it, it sort of takes your mind off work, even though it's still work but it's like something that gives you stuff to do so that you don't really stress about it. And also it's like, it's a complete, um, like not mindset shift. I don't have to worry about it. It's like the type of thinking you're doing when you're working for a client and the type of thinking you're doing when you're putting together a tutorial or a video, or whatever, is completely different. And so your brain sort of like rests some areas of it rest and others are more focused etc so it's uh it's a good way to find balance so for me it's kind of paradoxical because i was finding like rest uh in uh something that is still could be understood as work but uh it's just yeah i don't know no yeah, I that's can't. the thing actually i think it's like this whole period is kind of a blur in some way because it's some stuff went super quickly, like went by super quickly. And I have like very hazy recollection of it. And others were like super, uh, like I have very crisp and like detailed recollection of like other moments. But, um, and, and um, how long did it uh, take you to, to get used to the whole, because I can imagine like you have work that you said for a year, if I'm not wrong. And then you started working alone. And when you start working alone, no matter who you are, it's always a little bit... Uh, first, it's unstructured from the stream of work. So maybe you have periods of time where you have a lot of work and then periods of time where you don't have work. And then also, you have to be very good with money because not everything what you get, it's yours because you have to pay mm -hmm. taxes and so on. Sure. Uh, so it's more like, I guess on a yearly base or i don't know quarter yeah no, for sure it's like it's very that was one of the things that was funny when i was reading all this like financial personal financial stuff is that they were like if you're a freelancer you need to look at this table because there was like a specific table for people that had like incomes that were not making any sense and um but yeah it's it takes like honestly it takes a lot of time to sort of get used to it and even now I'm not like, I'm comfortable with it, but it doesn't mean I have like a structure that works properly. It's something I'm actually struggling with again uh, lately where um, there are stuff I want to do, but I'm not exactly sure on how I should organize my weeks or days so that I get them done properly. It's, and... uh, I think it's also phases, you know, like there's been, um, I don't remember if it was last year or two years ago, where I was like super efficient on everything and i wasn't feeling tired i was like just really efficient i would be like i was working on the course i was ha having like many commissions i was delivering very good work all the clients were coming back and were happy uh i was like i started like i was still doing the youtube thing so it was taking quite a bit amount of time even though the the videos are not like super edited and whatever but it was still like time consuming i was uh, i was going to the gym like five times a week it's just like very intense. And for some reason it was working. And then at some point there's like something that's just like shifts and the, the whole thing crumbles for some reason. And it gets very hard to get it back to it. 
So lately, I'm like, yeah. I can imagine <laughs> yeah. once the structure, once the structure, like you build up the structure, and then once it's out, because there is nobody, as I said, there. Like when you're employed, you're kind of on a rail railway. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. You, if I don't show up at work uh, after half an hour, somebody's gonna call me and be like, "Are you alive?" Uh, yeah. So, and in your case, you can decide. I think also it's the um, when you're in a job. I guess you have like a quite narrowed down uh, area, not areas of interest, but like stuff you're going to work on. And this is actually something that was bothering me when I was working in house is like, after a while, like everything is the same. I need more diversity. And so when you start having like many things on your plate, uh, like as we're saying, like the course, YouTube videos, the commissions, et cetera, and you need to, um, plus like uh, trying to have a social life and all that stuff, you start to juggle stuff that are actually very complicated to put together. And it's fun because, I mean, nothing is forcing me to do any of the things that I'm doing on the side of the, the commissions for my clients. I could literally, like in terms of revenue, 99% of the money I'm making comes from my images. So nothing is like I have zero incentive or like economical incentive to be doing what I do on the side to like try to teach and share stuff, et cetera. And this is like in terms of my uh, like uh, brain consumption, I spend more time thinking about those things than I spend thinking about my client stuff because everything is so I'm very I think I'm very every time I explain how I work to not explain, but like show how much work I get done in like a day or three days. People are like, yeah, but who are you working with? I'm like, you yeah, know, I'm working alone. I'm like, oh, okay. Because it's just like, I have a workflow that is very properly organized so that I can get a lot of things done very quickly and to a decent level. So that means that I have quite a lot of time to think about other stuff after. Have and, you optimized uh, slowly and steadily through the years to build up this uh, this ability? Yeah, yeah it's uh, like even when I started, I think like the like the little script that I still use in Photoshop. I think I coded it like six years ago, seven years ago. I sort of like update it every year to suddenly adjust what, it to how what, I. What what kind of uh, what kind of scripts are those? It's. One of the main thing is just like a folder structure and stuff that like do your lighting and integrate people and stuff like this. So it's like, uh, it's stuff I, I've put on Gumroad like several years ago for people if they want to buy it. And it's, uh, it's definitely not perfect, but it does save a lot of time. And I'm working on like on a new version now that is like uh, better all, and that still like saves a lot of time. All this stuff that you do, like, um, I don't know, the classes, some of them on YouTube are open for everybody, but there are also some of them that you have to, I think, subscribe or pay, or I don't remember. Um, you can explain it better, of course. <laughs> but um, like, aren't they like some sort of side stream passive? Pa passive is always a very, very vague uh, term because yeah. passive it's after you have put a lot of work. And then you put <laughs> exactly. it out there and then you're like, oh, he's doing passive income. He's not working. No, he did work a lot, did one product that it's repeatable. So yeah, yeah, um, it's not passive. Uh, so yeah, no, the, like for instance, the scripts is like bringing like a tiny amount of money that is like still fun to have. And the course at the moment is, uh, since I'm still developing it, it's costing me more than bringing money because I had to invest quite a bit for like, um, like part of the, uh, part of the, the content. So there's all like the video editing, etc. And since I'm not a, it's one of the things I'm almost proud of in the sense that I wanted to do it myself at some point. And then I was like, yeah, no, fuck it. I really can't do it myself. <laughs> so I'm going to pay someone to do the video editing. I'm going to pay someone to, put that scene on Unreal, et cetera. And so this is saving me time. It's costing me money, but actually in the end, it's fine. So at the moment, the course is not, uh, it's kind of like break even because I did like two courses last year or yeah, last year. And then I invested all the money to sort of develop the new version. But that's 
of course it's like the goal like the the course the course is fun because even though i'm like uh i won't say well now let's say it. i'm 100 percent doing it for the money in the sense that i wouldn't be putting as much work as i'm doing it now if i was not intending on like selling it because well i mean this would be but i mean you what you're trying to say is that the the quality you're trying to, to yeah yeah it's like to make I, I and mean, also if, the value if you want, yeah i mean the thing is like i could have done all the research and just keep all the knowledge for myself and just use it in my own projects which is half of what i'm doing but then i'm like pushing it further and being like i'm going to record proper videos and sell those so that can people so that people can learn so i have like uh so that's the thing when i'm saying like i'm doing it for the money is like the, this extra step that is not necessary in itself for me to be happy with the course is um is the reason also maybe i'm like maybe a little bit too hard on myself because when i started the it's just that it's very organic as i said i'm very disorganized or like <laughs> maybe i should say i'm more like of a like a thinking organically is like but it's it's very like difficult because at on one side you say you're very disorganized but on some sides you seem to be very structured because on one side you said you're like yeah you're in a sense uh clutter with your daily life but you're very structured in your workflow in the meanwhile mm. otherwise it's, you wouldn't be able to 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 do everything you do on your own yeah no for sure i think uh i think it's because i'm like that's what i wanted to say earlier i'm like i'm very lazy in a way so there are like when I see I'm doing something like the same task repetitively too many times, I'll be like, yeah, I need to automate that. So then I, I'll be willing to spend a week coding something that sort of saves me all the time to do what I was doing. So in that way, I'm like very efficient because I can, I'm good at identifying like tasks that can be simplified and automated, etc. So this saves me a lot of time. And then the free time that I have, sometimes I just spend it doing very disorganized thing. And um the the course for instance about like composition is a has been like a nightmare to organize because the more i was digging in the subject the more i was seeing like okay there's like so many subtopics that are connecting and it's very complicated or it's very different to uh understand something and to understand something enough to teach it and so that extra step is like, it means that you need to reorganize everything in a way that people will be actually able to understand it. Because basically it was like condensing like hundreds of books and hundreds of hours of like uh, tutorials that I've watched and like basically it's more than six or eight years of experience, et cetera. So it's a very dense thing to organize. And, and, and you have to explain even the simplest, stupidest thing that are in your mind because some of the things you do are obvious for your for yourself because you just yeah, do them. Yeah. No, that's that's true. It's like when you have like this sort of like automatism in your head and you're not conscious about them, then yeah, you can skip steps and people kind of lose you. So it's uh, it's a bit uh, it's a bit complicated. But um, uh, what was I gonna say? And yeah, so this course is very interesting because I it really helped me in understanding a lot of stuff on how I work. It really helped me in like restructuring and the way I work in a bit more advanced way, and it's sort of like um, yeah, that's why I was saying like organically evolved into something that I find more and more interesting the more I work on it. Even though at the beginning it was kind of a like just a more advanced tutorial that I was working on, and then like yeah, actually it could be built into something bigger. But I, I'm curious. Okay, so let's not talk about your workflow and your like. Well, I don't know if the at which stage is the preparation of the course, but um, we can anticipate this so that people that will listen can follow you, follow your website, follow your <laughs> newsletter, uh, your YouTube channel. We'll, we'll put all the links in, in the description of the episode. But what is going to be the program of this course? So who is the course for so is it for someone that's already a little bit experienced is it for someone that has never done anything with argvis and 3d visualization or i mean of course but by not done anything it's i mean not done at the level yeah, yeah. you do it uh everybody that 
he has studied architecture it's in that field has opened a 3d model sometimes or mm. has modeled something in some software um but yeah like um is it how long more or less it's gonna be because the thing is that with this this um field it's endless so you <laughs> can re, you can get models that need to be cleaned you can get just sketches because the architects are still in a very early phase so you need to actually model the things more than the architects even know um mm -hmm. then you can do interior exterior you can do video you can do i don't know uh 3d vr now it's the thing um yeah. so what are what is the program this it, you plan for this course and who joins what do they need to know in beforehand and what they're going to learn um so the the course itself is not like um well basically the reason i wanted to do the course is because according to me it's not on the market yet like i've followed many master classes many on-site many online master classes and all of them were like interesting but they were always missing something that i was looking for which was more like a theoretical approach to how images work so it's like understanding so basically in a word it's like understanding composition and the issue i had with um with the way it was dealt with in other uh courses is that it was always like a, a subtopic and for me it's like it's actually the main topic regarding image if you don't understand composition even if you are like the best user of 3s max and uh, v-ray your images will still be worthless for clients and the thing is so what i wanted to do was to sort of three things i guess is to first make people understand how much composition is very important in the end quality of your image because people are in my opinion way too much focused on the technical aspect because it's kind of like this ArcViz is kind of like too technical in the sense that people are like usually obsessed with computers and blah blah, blah. and they're just like uh like literally when you look at forums people ask about what's your settings and you're like dude like who cares about the fucking settings? It's just look at the image and understand why it's nice. The fact that the HDRI is at like multiplier one or three doesn't fucking change anything. You could have done it 10 different ways. And some people literally go through their career for 10 years and they still don't understand that it doesn't matter. So to answer your question, the course is literally for anyone that doesn't have the actual understanding of the fundamentals. And I know like people that are very like advanced in their career that took the course and they're like, oh, okay, I never looked at this topic that way. And they're like seeing that there's like a lot of topics that you take for granted that actually need like way more thinking when you're doing like images. So the but course will is it be model, will it be more focused on like modeling and then post-producing or will it be like already some model that you just render and put in Photoshop and then you learn how to do it? Uh, what is going to be the beginning, like the starting point, and then the the structure itself is like there's a pre-recorded part that is like just explaining the concept of composition from like A to Z, kind of, and it's like more than twenty hours of content of like explaining uh, the common misconceptions that people have about composition, re-explaining the term properly, and then taking each of the component of uh, of composition and re-explaining them like in depth on how basically the, the whole idea is like this deconstruction of like the term and reconstruction of how you can use that term in your own work. So there's like this uh, pre-recorded part. And then there's a live part that is like kind of a workshop where I uh, provide a scene that is like just an unreal scene that people walk around. And we go through like the whole process of uh, understanding the brief questioning the brief, uh, understanding what is the client after, and then selecting views, fine-tuning the views, fine-tuning the framing, fine-tuning the color, fine-tuning the lighting, and have like a proper narrative on like what is it, what it is that you're trying to achieve, and then having like proper feedback at the end to sort of like double check that the proposal that you have actually fits what the client was asking. Because there's a, also this like uh, sometimes discrepancy where the client asks for something and either you do directly what they ask for, even though it's not what they need. It's like the common uh, theme in like design is like there's what the client wants and what the client needs. 
and sometimes what the client asks for is uh, what the client needs. And so what you need as a professional or like a expert is to identify what the client really needs based on what they think or what they're telling you they want. And so from there, we sort of like develop uh, a sort of methodology to sort of question all the, the aspects that you have to have in mind when you're actually putting together an image. Basically, if you want, it's, it's fun because like you were asking about like, uh, is it like post-production, et cetera. It's, it's just thinking in a way, like it's not a tutorial, at least at the moment. It's not what I'm focused on because I know there are like already many good tutorials about post-production and many good tutorials about like three modeling, et cetera, on the market. So if people are like, can you do, like, can you explain? I mean, I can do it. I wouldn't mind explaining. Like I literally explain all my process and how I work and how I take my PSDs and stuff. But for me, it's like 5% of the value of the course. The rest is really into actually understanding the process of what it is to make images. So, but basically, mm, like it, one, like, is it going to be based on an exercise that people are going to do step by step, or is it going to be just a theoretical course? The whole pre-recorded part is a theoretical course about like all the concepts you have to understand. And the practical part, like the workshop is like one scene that we analyze together and that we use as a case study, basically. Mm, I understand. No, that's an interesting concept, but I think it's going to be maybe interesting for people that um, already maybe model and do images and they're not so happy with their uh, end result and then they can just level up. Yeah, it's honestly is when I did the first cohorts, it was like very wide array of people. I had like I even had architects that came that were not interested in visualization, but that were still very interested in the concept itself because it's actually like the whole idea also behind that because the course is quite business oriented. So there's like a whole part about like how to sell your ideas to clients because one of the thing I was like honestly getting fed up with was seeing on forums people being like, oh, my clients ruined my image. And I'm like, no, you just don't fucking know how to sell your image. And if you don't know how to sell it, it just means that you don't even know how to explain your work. And generally, that's the main issue people have is that they, they don't know how to explain why they think what they're selling is better than what the client wants. And so basically, a... it's oriented to people in the field because the people that have clients that get images are other visualizers. Yeah, yeah. But it's also like I have like uh, actually something I'm working on is this sort of like opposite view that is more toward architects so that they have like a better understanding of how they can collaborate with visualizer. Because I don't know if you saw that, but I like a long, not a long time ago, only a couple of years ago, I wrote two articles about uh, like common misconceptions that architects or archivists studio have with their clients and vice versa. And it was really always this idea of like miscommunication and the fact that they're even though they could like clients and visualizer could benefit from actually working together and understanding the the way each is working we tend to have like more of a hierarchical system where the client has to be always right even though it's not necessarily the case all the time and the problem is that we don't take the advantage because good not like good artists or at least i would say more like um artists that have like a literally a good uh, understanding of composition will be able to sell their ideas by because they will use like more unbiased principles like explaining why something works better than something else and it's not like anchored in tastes that's something that is always like very uh, misconstructed by people is like they think yeah no, it's just taste like you don't like it it's like no it's like the amount of things that is related to taste and like the reason you like an image or not is actually very very small there's like a lot of like uh, psychological stuff that happened way before you actually have your opinion on an image that makes the image work or not. And this is something that I'm trying to teach that people have like better, more striking images or not striking depending on what, the, what, the, what you're trying to do basically. So it's, yeah. uh, it's a good topic. <laughs> no, definitely. Um, I'm curious one thing that, I mean, I'm doing here the devil's advocate, you know, like a lot of the things that I ask, I ask them because I think what would people uh, be curious sure. to know and what I'm, uh, as an Italian, I'm skeptical, have to be skeptical and I have to <laughs> <laughs> ask stuff. <laughs> uh, no, but the question that I wanted to have is not so skeptical. It's more about like, there are a lot of people, as I said, and I have had several of them on the show already. 
uh, that are really, really good, like top of the chain. <laughs> and uh, I mean, they work, speak from themselves. And mm -hmm. um, why, why you wanted to do something like this? Like, why do you wanted to do a course specific on this topic? Um, and um, what is your background in learning those stuff i mean you said you, re 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 you read a lot of books and took a lot of classes but i mean every one of those people that i mentioned that has done this um amazing images and this amazing stuff um with their own studios have that skills so what do you specifically made you feel this is so important and what specifically wh why you why why it's so important for you this composition and how you diversify yourself from mm. the rest of the crowd let's say yeah it's to be honest i'm not i'm not like everybody likes to think they're different i'm not like that type of person i think like everybody has their own way of thinking etc one thing though that i noticed is that um like for a while i did those tear down videos where people were sending me the images and i was do i would be uh, doing like a review or a critique of their image and every time people would be like, whoa, this is like way more advanced than all the feedbacks I got from anybody else. I'm like, okay. And also you're like, I mean, talking to me is like, you're dealing with really specific stuff that I never read anywhere else. So I was like, okay, that's cool. That's a good, good, um, good sign. Another thing that I noticed when is when I was going, as I said to like those uh, classes, et cetera, is that the focus was always on the technical aspect like anytime it come from it came to like the topic of composition it was like very broad uh, statements and like people talking about the rule of thirds and stuff like this i literally in the course i mean in the course i don't do it that much but i could spend an hour explaining you what the rule, why the rule of thirds is like the shittiest uh rule that's ever been in composition and still 99% of the people will use it and will think that their image is good because they use it. And that's the thing is like, for me, it's always looking beyond what people think makes things work. And it's, for me, it's like, as I was saying, it's like a topic I'm interested in. So it's something I studied a lot. It's something that also is like, the more you know about something, the more uh, natural stuff come to you. It's like, people will be like looking at an image and thinking something's off, but I don't know why. Uh, I'll look at the image and be like, this is wrong. This, like, you're having this feeling of imbalance because this thing is, like, way too bright. You're having this feeling of blah, blah, because the cars are not, like, as in, uh, can, like, in sync with the rest of your image or whatever. It's, like, so the idea for me with the course is to more, like, help people building this sort of way of seeing that helps you in critiquing your own work. It's actually something very oriented toward freelancers because this is something people struggle with is to get feedback. And when you can't get feedback, you can't uh, you can't get better any, at anything because you you're only relying on your own eyes. And if your own eyes are not evolving because you're not studying, then you can't get better. And since people are obsessed with the technical aspect and they completely forget about the rest, it means that they're not like their technical aspect is getting better, but they the images themselves. It's like I'm not. It's not even me who's saying like their images aren't better. It's like they come to me saying. I don't understand why my image still doesn't look good. And I'm like, I can explain to you, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's just a completely different way of approaching a problem. Mm -hmm. So, and regarding my background is like, uh, as I said, it's like, there are people that are like way more experienced than I am. But one thing that I understood very quickly when it comes to teaching or to, as I said, not teaching, but sharing is that you will always know more than some people and some people will always know more than you do. So I would love to have people that know more than I do sharing stuff with, uh, sharing what they know with me. It doesn't seem to happen that much because for some reason, once you reach a very high level, you tend to not get time to teach basically, or to share because you're just like too busy working or doing other stuff, which is completely fine. So it's more like people that are like senior, middle, etc that or that people that want to make their career uh or that are more open to teaching and sharing that can do it so yeah it's like uh i'm like sort of like not selling myself as in like 
am I the am I the best tutor uh, to to teach you about composition in the world? No, but I'm like one of the few that is available and that actually cares about that subject because most of the others will be let's talk about Photoshop and I'm like yeah let's please not talk about Photoshop for once. Mm. No, definitely. I like this principle you just explained, which is basically the one of the core ideas that I made a podcast for. Because um, first of all, you live only your life, so you have only your experience. And the other thing is that, I mean, no matter how famous and successful, whatever, like I don't like the word successful, I like <laughs> maybe establish and I talk about... Um, finding your own accomplishment because mm -hmm. you might be, I don't know, you might be very successful in your work, but then be miserable altogether if the rest of your life yeah, it's, it's not working. Um, so the podcast was about this, about finding out the behind the scenes of people from different fields, different levels can be, for me, it would be interesting to talk to an architecture student now, maybe, mm -hmm. because... Um, they are like the the generation Z. So how do they see architecture? They're gonna be the future, mm -hmm. or or Argvis, They will be the next one. Uh, sure. We will be taking over. Like I think in this years, millennials are the one that are becoming the major workforce, or will be becoming, and then the next generation will be coming next. Um, so I think it's very it's very true what you said that uh, you know as much as you know and you don't know what the other knows and um therefore it's interesting to get these conversations and yeah it, and exactly it's like one of the whole thing the whole point when i started was also this idea of starting a conversation the thing is that it's very hard to start a conversation when your audience is very small when you're and, and when people actually don't even have that culture or that uh, drive to actually talk about those subjects. So that's why I always enjoy like listening to podcasts and interviews. It's like because people are because sorry people are actually talking. It's very different than reading a book where it's just like you pass not passively but like receiving information. Whereas if you have like people talking and exchanging ideas, it's a completely different thing. And it's kind of the hope I had when I was like uh, like literally every time I post a video. Uh, or if I talk about my course or whatever, I would be happier if someone started saying, you're completely wrong and start to explain me why so that I would start learning something and be like, oh, okay, you're actually right. This is interesting. Then having people being like, whoa, this is great. Thank you. And I'm like, what the, I mean, it's good for the ego, but you're not learning anything. You're, the only feedback you have is that you might be on the right track of something, but. Yeah, well, there is a lot of hate nowadays as critique. Like, um, <laughs> I've heard about that. <laughs> Luckily, we're uh, not having that much haters or not at all. But um, mm -hmm. like, yeah, as, for example, my thumb of Ral, for example, uh, rule of thumb when I when I comment something on online, if it's mm -hmm. a course or something, uh, if I if I don't like it for some reason that I can structure in a logic mm -hmm. way. So I would start with something like my comment below the conversation. I mean, we're taking as an example, the videos, it would mm -hmm. be like, I really like what you do, uh, but I'm in this, so to say, like to put in advance that I'm not hating you. I actually gonna still yeah. love you. Uh, <laughs> um, but in my opinion, this is, could be better, could be different. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and that person can eventually read it and reply or just take a lesson or contact me. Um, if I don't like something because it annoys me, like, because everybody gets annoyed at someone just because we're people, um, mm -hmm. I think, oh, I don't want to be the one grumpy below commenting stupid stuff, um, unless it's something very very brutally i don't know against my principles and mm -hmm. then i'll just like uh, unfollow that person and just stop being annoyed at or that yeah. organization or whatever and i think nowadays 
I don't know, maybe because it's always up there, maybe because it's written, maybe because it's not face to face. Uh, people tend to be like, oh, your fucking voice sucks or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. You cannot change your voice. Like you just can. Yeah. So yeah, I that's think the funny thing is that sometimes people get crazy for like very weird reasons. And you're like, yeah. So as you say, it's like unfollowing or blocking or whatever is like the, the easiest thing. I used to be like very bad at this, but more like not on the, definitely not in the artist field. I never, not that I never cared about it, but like, I, as I said, it's like very start, very hard to start a conversation there. So I never had any issues, if I may say, but more like political stuff. And I would get like angry at people for like saying stuff that don't make sense to me. And now I'm like, yeah, I actually don't even fucking care anymore because it just like, it's this uh, very simple principle. It's like when you get annoyed, uh, what is it like? Uh, like anger is uh, the punishment uh, punishment you put on yourself or yeah. someone else's the mistake or whatever. And it's uh, like, yeah, or it's hating much... someone, it's um, hating swam someone. It's like um, drink drinking poison and trying to kill the other person. Something like that was it. <laughs> I didn't know this one, but yes, yeah, it's, it's it's like this idea of like yeah, it's better to not care too much, but. Uh, regarding feedback, I always like, I'm very, like, I'm always after feedback, especially like more in-depth feedback that would explain things rather than like, and that's the thing is like, we're like, that's one, one of the reasons I don't like social medias in general is that they shorten our attention span and uh, the time we take to actually exchange ideas with people. So comments will be like emojis and that's it. And people will never stay more than two minutes on a video. So it's something that for me, as soon as you start talking about subjects that require more, uh, more time, basically, it's, it shows the limit of this sort of platforms. And I'm happy because even though like I'm making generalization, but on the other side, you have like podcasts that have like two, three, four hours of content in a single video and people like watching the whole thing. It's interesting, but it's just that, um, sometimes it's very hard to, to, to do this shift. Especially, I think, in our industry where people are more like tutorials, tutorials, so super quick. The number of people, like when you look at a tutorial that is slightly too long, you'll still have people being like, oh, thank you, it's amazing. And then you'll have like a bunch of people saying, like, how the fuck do you take so long to do something? You should edit it. And you're like, dude, just fucking enjoy the fact that someone is putting a video for free and stop complaining. It's like, no, it's but crazy. I... I see, for example, social media um, the same way I see a hammer. You can use it to put a knee, a knee in like to, to use it as a tool, or you can hit someone in the head. Yeah, so yeah, so sure. I think it's a tool. Um, I, I don't like um, social media either because, as you said, I mean, I'm affected by it. Like, I, I guess because I have to use it for finding all the people that are on the show. Yeah. And this yeah, is the sure. same way I fi I fi like, mm, I, f I found you through, I mean, social media or through the internet and so mm -hmm. on. And um, the, for me, it's positive because I can text you and then I can bring you on here and then have the conversation, put out a conversation. But the reality is also that the conversation in a, such a long form, it's... Uh, it's not the catchiest content, you know, and I don't do it because it's the catchiest. Maybe the catchiest would be to do something completely different. Uh, but it's also like um, the value that you're going to create. Because by now, if a person, no matter at which stage of their career they are, even they're students or they're advanced, as you said, they know just different things. They can go through this, I call it now database of conversations. Uh, mm -hmm. So, for example, if somebody wants to work in Arcvis, they can go and see Arcvis artists um, that were the first one, like Luxigon. They can go mm -hmm. see from Romania, Bulgaria, from France, from uh, from uh, Italians that work in Barcelona. Um, then they can hear the stories from their point of view, and yeah. they can be like, "Okay, I, I do I, or now they're gonna hear your story, what it means to work alone." Uh, or working in a team or growing the company. We had like um, the conversation with uh, um, Andros from Brick Visuals where he was 
super yeah. interesting about how you grow a company from a few people to now they're 70 or something and um yeah. and the value it's it's there like the value it's not always in the views maybe one person gonna uh or maybe it's more of like a longer term idea mm -hmm. I'm, i learned myself a lot of things because as i told you like i had the conversation with all these people and everybody knew something different um and another thing that i uh, don't like and i've been taught like this by my parents is to never be jealous of someone because maybe mm -hmm. if somebody hear you talking and it hears oh you're so lucky you work alone you can live anywhere in the world you are talented because you do nice images um yeah that's the surface that is what we all gonna see and uh what what is out there but we don't know all the struggles we don't mm -hmm. know all the times you need to do tax returns we don't know uh all the times that you don't know where what is your home and where is your home country so i think it's important to have like um these conversations to understand i always like try to make these questions to understand what is your lifestyle not only your work because yeah, yeah. um yeah like if the work it's one part of your life it's important because um, maybe it brings you money and um, allows you to do other things but also you have health you have relationship you have friendships you have the weather outside so um for example when i had andros on for the from brick mm -hmm. we had a conversation like two hours it was super interesting his whole story about how he started how they started the office how it grew what they do that they expand into other fields they do something in real estate they sell some as you do but more maybe more intentionally uh, they sell some add-ons for yeah, other plugins. other yeah, plugins they're very, they're very good and and then we were talking about this for two hours and i was like that sounds so good and then i told him okay everything sounds great but how much do you work or did you work to get at this point and he goes like oh yeah i worked so hard that like i have now health issues and i don't wish you to have the same stuff and mm -hmm. i'm like um i don't know i mean we didn't go in detail but yeah, yeah. people have to know that there's a price to pay for everything you um for everything you do in your life like for example when i'm back home a lot of people say oh you're so lucky you work in germany yes but there is a lot of stress there is a lot of work i'm a far away from my family the weather mm -hmm. sucks so everything you have to decide <laughs> uh, <laughs> what you want to do in your life whether you prefer to be i don't know it, there there are always pluses and, and minuses yeah. and honestly like the funny thing is that the more freedom you have the harder it gets to actually choose anything like literally lately i'm like trying to think about where i want to live and since i can live anywhere it actually becomes a problem because when you're like with someone that can work like sorry we have to live here it's like it solves so many issues and when you start traveling you see all the other issues that comes like as you were saying it's like there's always anyway a like downside to any upside it's like yeah it's great to travel but when you have to take care of like all your health insurance to make sure that you're covered everywhere you're going when you have to take care of like being able to access your money everywhere you're going being able to carry all the fucking workstation that you have it's like it's very not it's not that um it's just and that's the thing is like psychologically it has the same importance to the person that to who is happening that for someone else that is dealing with other issues it's just because it's their own issues and you tend to make them more important than others and then you're like yeah but you're just dealing with like how complicated is it to uh, send the workstation across the sea it's like yeah well it's quite complicated and it's very stressful because if it breaks then you can't work and you need to invest like six seven thousand euros in like very quickly time so that you can start working again etc so it's like yeah it's pretty stressful so it's a lot yeah. of things like this and it's fun because like what you were saying is uh it reminds me of a again a very disorganized video i did um a while ago uh talking about like uh this problem that we have that we compare ourselves to people and what you were saying is like uh the amount of work one thing that i know is like very complicated is that well, not complicated but very co uh, common rather is people uh 
artists or whatever you want to call them. They look at their own images and then they look at the images of uh, very talented people and they're like, I want to be like this. And they work maybe six months, one year. And they're like, fuck, it's, it's not working. And then you look at those guys and like, dude, it's been doing this, what you're doing for like the past uh, 300 days. They've been doing it for like 25 years. And you expect that suddenly, because we're in 2022, you will be able to bypass 20 years of experience. And it's like, there's a lot of things like this where we expect like this sort of like a super uh, instant gratification of like, yeah, I've been studying, so I should be able to understand everything. It's like, no. Literally, I have people, um, not to, maybe just to sell my course again, <laughs> but it's like, I have some, uh, some people that took my course last year that are like friends now for like, that have been very, like become very close and like exchanging ideas with them a lot. And they're saying, we're still revisiting your course because there are stuff that we are only starting to understand exactly what you meant. So on one way, it means that I'm just not clear when I'm explaining stuff. But on the other, it just means that also there's like a lot of value in revisiting a lot of things and that stuff just take time. It's just like architecture. After five years, you know nothing, but you know that you like architecture or not. <laughs> no, but I, I make this analogy, for example, between studying and working. It's like uh, when you get your driving license at the driving school, and when you start driving alone on the streets. So what you get taught on the driving school is just theory and it's just an ideal ideal way of driving around. But when mm -hmm. you go on the streets, it's a completely different level because you have to actually see the actual... Like, of course, if somebody is breaking the rules and is going to cut your way, you're not going to drive straight if you're going to hit each other just because it's your right to do so. You're going to stop <laughs> and you're going to let them go and you're going to be like pissed off. And um, the same thing is with architecture. And, and for example, one reason why there is no conversation about theory is because I think also within architects, you're so much into the daily problems of your project in professional level that you're like what you study at the university at the theoretical level, all this stuff about theory of architecture and i don't know all the stuff that you study that are theoretical mm -hmm. uh, they're so far away at your workplace or they're so maybe in the background maybe they're automatic maybe they're obvious <clears throat> so um i don't know i've never worked at an office where the boss of the office had an ideology about we're going to do yeah. this building because it's going to change architecture or something. <laughs> no, it's because the client wants a big thing with a lot of space. It has to look good and be resellable. And we don't think about, uh, I don't know, l'unité d'habitation or yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, free form, free floor plan. Uh, I have uh, the clients calling me that they need something by two weeks ago and I haven't sent it yet. So mm -hmm. there is no time for conversation. And I guess that, not I guess, I'm sure that, that because I know other people from Argus is the same thing. You have to, at the end of the day, your goal is to do nice images or the best images or cheap images, whatever, sell them to your clients. Next, next, next. This is like mm -hmm. how it works. And then... Um, everything extra it's what brings the extra value um uh, i think yeah i think it's important i um there is one guy i follow on on youtube and i always try to get on the podcast but it's very difficult um he has this channel it's called 30 by 40 workshop that's his um office the, he's an architect and he does this video about how to start your own architecture yeah, firm, yeah, yeah. How, what is his process and then, for example, when he was budgeting how much he should charge his clients, uh, he has also a budget about, I don't know, research and development. So like that he actually gets paid so much that he mm. has time to think <laughs> about yeah. how to get better. So this is a very important uh, point of view and um, I think should be taken into the <laughs> equation. Yeah, that's the thing is like, I think it's, kind of a matter of discipline and kind of a matter of how you market yourself as well. There are like, um, if you look at the work of like OMA, they have like a AMO, so which is like the research part of their company. And I mean, it's not the, it's a good example, but it's not the best example in this time. It's like, it's a huge company. So of course they have the ability and money to do that type of thing. But even when I, where I was working uh, at 
Pika, they had like a, they had like a research poll where they were doing like stuff regarding uh, like urbanism and stuff like that. But as you say, it's like it's like the cherry on top that you can't always spend time on. So because it's that's the thing is like the the main issue with like theory is that it's something that is not really actionable and really uh, like you can't really see it. And even though it has like a lot of value for the people actually designing, if it's properly integrated in the like workflow and the, the, the sort of philosophy of work, it's still something that clients are a bit like uh, reluctant to pay for. At least uh, if you literally write it that way, it's like you're paying for uh, 10% of the research uh, department uh, for this year. And you're like, man, who, why, why do we need them? <laughs> well, so, um, this is a curiosity I, I wanted to ask you in the beginning, but somehow we didn't um, get to that point. Um, I'm really curious, how did you come up with the name? I, I call your office Horoma. I don't know if it's pronounced that way or it's Oroma. I don't know if it's a French mm-hmm. word. What, what, what does it mean? Does that mean something or how did you come up with this name? It's, uh, it's a Latin word that means uh, vision. So I was, when I was looking for a name, for some reason, I, I wanted something Latin. No fucking idea why. It just sounded good. And the reason why I wanted something related to vision is that because there's like a whole of like a police anything where for me, like vision is like the basic thing is like doing visuals. But the thing is that I still have this ID. Even when I started, uh, I had this idea of like, it needs to branch out somehow into different uh, projects. So lately I'm working on the, the course on the teaching aspect, et cetera, which is something I'm very like more and more invested in. There's one aspect also that I've always been in, uh, interested in getting back to, which is actually designing and building stuff. So this is something I'd like to do as well. And I like I have friends that I work with that have like we have this sort of like uh, architecture aspect, and we're like building stuff as well. But I'm like not the most uh, invested in it, unfortunately, because it's very time consuming. And other other like endeavors that I'm like kind of interested in. So it's more like this idea of the uh, like a uh, vision uh, in a broader term. So I thought it was quite fitting. I quite like the name. So I like the sound of it. <laughs> and also, but this is something I kind of regret is um, um, like when you use a, a, a name, then you sort of like are not the face of something, which for me is fine. But the problem is um, the more, like when I started working, I had this misconception or like at least this belief that uh, it wasn't good to be seen as working as a single person. It was more like this idea. So that's why I was like phrasing stuff like we, we, we is like, there are like more people behind Oroma than just a single person. And the more I talk with my clients, the more I talk with other people, they're like, you know, it's actually not that it's the opposite, but it's more like if you show like a great portfolio or like whatever the portfolio I have, I don't know if we can call it great. Uh, you and you say you've been doing it alone and like all the side projects you've been doing them on your own it actually is a sign of somebody that is like pretty pretty good so that's why like i'm working on the new version of the site website and like sort of like removing all the the branding aspect that is like sort of suggests that there's several people behind it even though at the moment i'm also starting to consider having more like active collaboration with some people but it would still be me in charge of like 99% of the thing. But yeah, so that was the the name thing. <laughs> no, I, I, this is a very interesting aspect because I have uh, watching a video. Uh, there is this guy in um, in Italy. I think he's called Raffaele Gait or something like that. He's a marketing expert um, you, and he's a growth growth hacker or something like that you, okay. you you can check it online what is growth hacking it's actually a technology to not a technology it's more a method to launch startups and ideas yeah. um and it was what it was used for for example for um dropbox back in the days um and he was he does this video about marketing and he was explaining the concept of personal brand and how important it is to have a personal brand because your personal brand is projected on everything you do. Like, for example, Elon Musk, right? It's an obvious mm. example that we all know. You, you like Tesla, you like SpaceX, you like uh, all the merch they launch for like um, 
period of time. He's now mm-hmm. buying Twitter. All the people are whether again, it's whether you love it or hate it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that nobody's perfect. Mm, he's not perfect either. But like, he has this personal brand that. Mm-hmm. And it was back in the days with Steve Jobs, right? Like Apple could launch something super stupid, uh, and um, and people would be like, "If Steve thinks that's super <laughs> smart, it must be super smart." In architecture, for for example, for me, it's Bjork Ingels. Like um, he has a yeah, very yeah. strong personal brand. Uh, again, uh, I think I've talked about this in other podcasts or backstages, but I think you can love him or hate him. I I don't care. Like I don't think that everything he does is perfect or <laughs> everything he does is ra- wrong and super bad. But um, he has this strong personal brand, and this is why he also can branch. He's now starting, for example, this new company. It's called Neighbor, which I don't know what exactly it's gonna do. I think it's gonna be a sort of a developer of sustain of um, affordable uh, housing. living, yeah, okay. housing. Uh, and because he is doing it, I think it's legit. But maybe it's not legit. I don't know. But yeah, I know yeah, that... that's the thing when you you have like a sort of like as you say like personal brand. You sort of like start to look more at who's behind everything. And it's especially yeah. uh, true in like the tech world. Is like this is a new app developed by that guy. And like, oh okay, that must be interesting. Like Paul Graham is working on this. Like, oh, okay, then it's gonna be something interesting. Or like they went through like. Later. so oh yeah this actually must be an interesting uh, startup to follow etc so yeah it's, yeah. Uh, it's and then and it's, it's true that when you're talking about like a uh, bjark is that he embraced that really efficiently and it really does show like uh, the difference in terms of uh, philosophy and the way you work and the way the type of project you deal with and when you look at the i mean even because it's like literally it was already the case like 10, 10 years ago, even probably even before Instagram or like uh, social, like really advanced social media, but they already had like a way of branding themselves that was completely different than what was uh, happening. And yeah, yeah. Very, very interesting to follow. And sometimes even in a very extreme way, I mean, um, yeah, that of course it's like, and again, like for example, this is something we said before and I said in, also, one of my first podcasts is that also there are people that when they study or when they try to start an office or something, they start comparing themselves to these big offices. And I'm like, like, do, do you know what kind of infrastructure that office has? And <laughs> like, um, like probably Bjork Ingels can open Grasshopper. <laughs> but <laughs> that's yeah, it yeah, sure. <laughs> and uh, all the other stuff like I, I know personally Oliver Thomas he's like uh, one of the computational guy and they like they do all these smart people they research and work only on specific parts and then they put everything together there is a whole visualization team so it's you cannot compare yourself to <laughs> there is this this rule like of uh, 3M uh, money means um, men, so it means like mm-hmm. how much money you have, how much people you have, and how much time you're spending on something to evaluate how good you can do it. For example, um, I in the beginning when I started the podcast, I was being super because my girlfriend helps a lot with all the stuff that are happening in the background, mm-hmm. and I was super harsh on me because I was saying I must suck because. There are people that for the same time become super viral and super popular and stuff yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. And then we head on like the guys that does this channel, it's called Never Too Small. They they do like these yeah. short movies about these small accommodations and how to arrange them. And yeah, yeah. because my girlfriend lo- loves them, she interviewed them. I just listened to the podcast <laughs> and they're like actual video makers. And they have started like doing this like as a side project where yeah. two, three professional video makers do like a video clip yeah. about a small house and it's 10 or 15 minutes and it looks so awesome. And then some people going to go there and compare themselves to this stuff. But it's not so simple because uh, they're, they're, that's like a huge team. Uh, and so that's the thing. So, yeah. like, even though there's kind of a trend about like being a bit more honest about this type of thing uh, or like transparent, it's still the 
bulk of the thing is to um, curate things so that everything looks very easy. And so that's why you're like so easily deceived into thinking, why the hell is it not happening to me if I'm doing kind of something that looks similar, but at the same time, there's like so much happening behind that they're not doing the same way that explains kind of the difference. So it's, uh, and the thing is like, I mean, like social media, not in, not in general, but like, it's like, it's really about like, uh, comparing yourselves to people in general, especially like, um, Facebook and Instagram, YouTube a little bit less, but depends on the, the channels you're following, but it's always supposed to make you not necessarily feel better about yourself more about like, yeah, I I'm 30 and I'm not a millionaire. I'm, uh, I'm not living in the middle of like a penthouse, or whatever, you know, like, yeah, well, this, uh, it's just because the algorithm feeds you stuff to make you feel like it's like a majority of people, but there are actually like a few, very few people that are actually able to do what you're actually trying to do. And that's one thing also, it's completely, I don't want to get too philosophical or whatever, but it's something you mentioned as well earlier is like this idea of, I think it's when I started uh, working, I had like very weird goals and over time, you feel that those goals are like just fed to you by what you're looking at. You're like, yeah, I'd like to make that amount of money. Why? Like, actually, I don't have fucking ID why I chose that number. But nowadays, I have like a, a better understanding of what are the things I'm after. And they're like completely different than like five or 10 years ago. And it's yeah. something I think you need to question very quickly because otherwise you can completely drift off to purchase things that actually don't even matter uh, in the long run. So, no, but also like, for example, I don't know, you chase these dreams that you don't know why. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little bit like about this topic and then we can wrap it up. But for example, my favorite movie, it's um, one of my favorite movies is Into the Wild. Because mm -hmm. that movie, it's like an extreme example of what means to follow something uh, without knowing why. So, for example, this guy in the whole movie, he wants to go to Alaska because mm -hmm. he decided that he wants to go and <laughs> along the way along the way to alaska he meets so he leaves his family and meets people that are his real family let's say he had a screwed up family and he meets along the way all these people that they love him and he doesn't notice it because it's too much in this moment to go to alaska and he mm -hmm. meets really this series of people. He, he meets his mom and dad that he never had. He meets like the grandpa. He meets like the girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And he's like, no, 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 I have to go to Alaska. And then he goes to Alaska and realizes that uh, he says it in his diary. Joy is only when it's shared, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and it's the same thing when you're young and you're, I don't know, still beginner or you have this big inspiration. Ah, I'm going to go to work for pure kingels or for whatever i'm gonna be a big mm -hmm. manager i'm gonna make a lot of money and then slowly you realize what is the price to pay for this stuff like uh working hard working extra hours not seeing your dear ones not spending time with your girlfriend with your kids later or whatever mm -hmm. and then you start thinking hmm do i really think to like for example i have a colleague uh she is a little older and she works just two days a week. She works Monday and Tuesday and then she doesn't work. And I tell her every time she leaves on Tuesday, I tell her, have a good weekend. And I, <laughs> and I tell her, you know what? If Jeff Bezos knew you, you exist, he would be jealous of you because you don't have his money, but you have none of his stress. <laughs> yeah, no, sure. So... Um, that's the thing is like it's really a balance to find as not as quickly because the thing is like as you say it's like when you have kids everything changes etc but you have to find a balance in between the things you're interested in and how much yeah how much effort you want to put in we tend to underestimate the amount of efforts that are needed to achieve anything no yeah but also not kids even if you have like a relationship uh, and you want to spend time with your partner yeah, like I what? I watched this movie, this other movie, Free Solo, the the guy that goes up without any ropes, Alex Hono. Yep. And in the documentary, he meets his girlfriend. And a few days before he attempts to do the free climbing, he tells her to leave because he needs the last few days to 
concentrate and be like a, he he calls it like the samurai mentality where he needs mm-hmm. to be to completely out of of connection so that he can focus on on one this on this one thing and that's so correct because Mm, I mean, even if you're not doing something extreme, maybe sometimes you have a short-term sprint you have to do on something and you really need to shut off all these thoughts and to shut off like, oh my God, I'm not spending the evening with my dear ones or with my Mm -hmm. girlfriend and to be like focused as a warrior a little bit and ready to sacrifice that to be then free later. So yeah, I think I, I think that later in life you just realize how much you have to pay for each thing not in terms of money but in terms of other t- things I think that's the thing uh, but let's conclude on a positive note like every <laughs> every every podcast um, concludes in a very positive and uh, not so deep deep tone um, like it was great to talk to you and uh, I think I uh, think it's it was great to meet you in Sofia first of all and yeah, we're going to do another <laughs> we, we're going to do another whole podcast about your because I met you when you arrived and uh, mm-hmm. I don't know how it was you stayed for 5 days or so so I never got the chance to understand how did you find uh, Bulgaria as a as as we say in Bulgaria as a westerner and uh, <laughs> <laughs> because we're not westerners we're like uh easterners and um yeah we, we i ask every guest so because it's um we all do creative jobs and we all end up in these situations where there are like little rats that uh, we are not so um as you said not so structured not so motivated uh mm-hmm. do you have like a favorite uh book movie maybe sport place uh or activity whatever activity or podcast or something that uh, when you're a little like low on morale low on inspiration you do it might be also some say meditation some say i shut off everything can be anything hmm. or whatever it comes to your favorite book that you like to read for example i don't know if there is something that pops up um many things unfortunately as I yeah, say, you like, can go with all of them always, regarding like shutting off it's uh like going to the gym is like the only thing only place where i can not think about work or nothing about anything actually if i go for a walk if i like it's literally the only place where i will not be seeing things through the filter of like how is what i'm seeing useful for work because I just go there to disconnect and I put the music on and I just focus on what I'm doing. So this I found is it's important to have this sort of like activity that you can do that sort of like lets you take a take off from what you're usually thinking of in terms of books and like I'm huge content. Uh, what is it called? Like uh, consumer like consumer. Thank you. So yeah, I watch a lot of like a lot of everything. Actually, it's like Kind of, I don't like when people say that because it sounds very weird. It's like, yeah, so you don't, you don't even know what you like. It's like, yeah, no, no, I, so like a lot of uh, series, a lot of uh, movies, but I'm more and more like the issue I had with, uh, when I was starting to put together a single composition is that I was trying to look at more, not original, but like different stuff. So I tried to get like references from like uh, paintings and things like that. So uh, I will like visit a lot of museums. Uh, get like uh, even of like old very new stuff that I want to sort of like get a better understanding of etc something I try to do more and also reading I read a lot of fictions all the time because it's something I love science fiction so I'm reading science fiction literally I won't say every day because that wouldn't be true but at least one or two books a month about like completely unrelated stuff even though Science fiction is like very, like it feeds your imagination quite a lot. So I wouldn't say it's uh, it's uh, making me rest, but at least it's like something that is less work related. There's one book that I read recently. I don't know if I would advise to read it, but it's like called 4,000 Weeks. Uh, I don't even know the author, right? Because it's like when I read stuff like a bit more compulsively, it's like I don't even, I remember some stuff and then I switch. But this one was interesting because it was like a contrarian take on productivity. And since we talked a bit about it, I found it very interesting because it was like, 
explaining like 4,000 weeks is the number of weeks we on average have on earth. And it was like explaining how we have this sort of like way of seeing everything through the filter of like, is it productive or not? And I remember that I've been like that quite a, for a long time. And nowadays I'm like less like this and reading this book actually sort of like helped in reinforcing this idea that you need to find a bit better what matters and how to sort of like uh, experience a bit better what's happening. And still, if you want to look at stuff regarding work, one of my favorite kind of book, even though it's like, it's, it's kind of weird to say that a, a work book is going to be your favorite book. <laughs> my favorite book is like, uh, uh, what's it called? Like Brave New World by Aldo Saxon. That's like my favorite real book. But my favorite like self-development book is called Die Empty by Todd Henry, where it has like this whole philosophy about how that's the thing is like actually literally the opposite of the book I just mentioned before, where it's like this idea of how you can optimize everything in order to get stuff done and focus on the things you should do be doing, like you feel you should be doing with your life. What what so, is the, the, really like the, just, the title again? The, die empty. So it's very die empty. Very the sound of it is very like gloomy, and that's why I like it, I think, because it's like purposefully uh, written in a way that is like, uh, but actually it's a, it's a decent, uh, like interesting message, I'd say. No, it uh, sounds super interesting. And um, <laughs> I, I will be um, sharing all the links about uh, Horoma and about the classes about your YouTube channel so that people that are willing to learn a little bit more about how to make better looking projects or to make bad projects look better. Well, <laughs> uh, they will be they feel like they can learn it from me, but it's uh, at least what yeah. I'm trying to do. But that's cool. That's thank you for sharing. It will be yes. greatly appreciated. <laughs> so people just go below in the in the links and check also the links related to the Creative Insider so that you can join Instagram, YouTube, Discord, Twitch, wherever we are, everywhere. And Simon, thank you very much. This is the first yeah, time for you on, on TCI, but it doesn't have to be the last one. So whenever yeah. there are news, you're welcome back. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Bye, Georgia. Bye. -bye. <laughs>